Good morning. Welcome to all of you. My name is Mark Pettit, and I am one of the contracts teachers uh, here at BU Law School. Um, Sullivan versus O'Connor is one of the cases that I teach on, in my first year uh, contracts course. So today I plan to conduct this class just as I would um, a normal first year contracts class. Uh, just a few uh, minor exceptions. One is that uh, we are being videotaped. Um, we're being videotaped so that we can present this mock class to people on the web who can't come to campus. So the focus is on me, not on you, so I hope that doesn't deter anyone uh, from speaking up. Also, in this class, I will call on volunteers only. In the actual class, <laughs> I call on people at random. Uh, and finally, I'm going to keep uh, the last 10 minutes of the class um, available for questions that you have to ask me about what goes on in a law school classroom, about BU Law School, law school in general, uh, any questions that you might have of a faculty member. Um, I assume that you all had a chance to look at the case. Um, I recognize that some of you haven't had a chance to look at it uh, very thoroughly. Um, if anyone needs a copy, I think there are additional copies in the back. What I really hope is that I can entice many of you, most of you, to participate in the discussion. That's what a law school class is. It's a discussion. Um, as a general matter, we don't lecture to you. We don't talk at you. Uh, we engage you. And you have to contribute to the discussion. OK, so is there anyone brave enough to get us started by telling us the story here, the facts of the case, um, without using any legal terms? Anyone want to break the ice and tell us about Alice Sullivan? Yes, thank you. Um, Alice Sullivan um, said that she entered a contract to have um, plastic surgery done on her nose. Okay, what, what line of work was Alice Sullivan in? Entertainment. All right, she was a professional entertainer. Okay, what was wrong with her nose? Um, had, um, she thought it was too prominent. Too big, all right. So she's an entertainer. Um, her nose is too big. So she goes to Dr. O'Connor, um, and what is he going to do for her? Um, he says he's going to fix it um, um, in two operations to make it smaller. Right. And instead... Um, make it smaller and shorter and more pleasing in relation to her other features. Uh, two operations. Okay, she agrees to this. Um, does the operation happen? I do have a visual aid here, too. They, they, they describe the nose. You know, so she's asking for a smaller nose. And um, this is what she gets. Okay? It says, her nose now had a concave line to about the midpoint, at which point it became bulbous. Viewed frontally, the nose from bridge to midpoint was flattened and broadened and asymmetric. Okay? So I think this is a pretty good representation of uh, the nose that was delivered uh, to Alice Sullivan. OK, and it took three operations to get this, right? Um, how much did she pay? It was something like $622. OK, you have to remember, this is cases from 1973. The events were in the 1960s. You know, you couldn't get a doctor to give you an aspirin in a hospital for $600 today. But uh, this was uh, quite a while ago. OK, so um, what happens after that? Is, can I get someone else to volunteer? What happens after you know, she gets this uh, gross nose? I'll leave this. It's a little uncomfortable. I'm going to leave this as plaintiff's exhibit A. OK, so we'll leave that right there. OK, so what does Alice Sullivan do when she's disappointed in the results of these operations? Yes? She brings Dr. O'Connor she brings Dr. O'Connor to court. And what claims does she bring? So her first claim is that um, it's a breach of contract claim, saying that <clears throat> he promised to enhance her beauty and improve her appearance. Uh, instead, he disfigured and deformed her nose and caused her pain in body and mind and subjected her to other damage and expense. 
Okay, so that was count one. Breach of contract, you promised me to improve my nose, and this is what you delivered. And the second one was malpractice. Um, okay. He, she charged that he had been guilty of negligence in performing the surgery. Okay, he didn't perform uh, the surgery with the kind of care expected of a plastic surgeon. Um, okay, she brings these claims. How does she do in court? Is there a trial? The, uh, there is. There's a trial by jury. Trial by was. jury. Okay. Uh, and what does the jury decide? The jury finds that the um, she, they find for the plaintiff on the contract count on the breach of contract, and they find for the defendant on the negligence count. Okay. So Alice Sullivan wins for on the breach of contract count, but loses on the negligence, the malpractice count. Um, and does the jury award her an amount of money? Uh, yes, the jury awards her, I believe it was uh, uh, sorry, $13,500. $13, $13,500. Okay, what happens next? Um, they go back. Uh, well, the defendant says that that was unfair, um, that the judge misinstructed the jury what to take into account for damages. Okay. Go back, go back and say to the jury, hey, let's do this all over again. <laughs> well, more or less, but not the same jury, yet not the same court. Um, they, okay. they don't go back. So what do they do, anyone? Yeah. They filed exceptions. They filed exceptions. That's during the trial. But after the trial is over, the jury gives the 13-5, what do they do? Yes. They appeal. They appeal to a higher court, OK? They don't go back, in the sense they don't go back to the same court. They're appealing to another court. They're saying to the higher court, the lower court made mistakes, um, I want a new trial. And in fact, both sides appealed. Okay? So that's the story. Um, I usually provide some additional information to my students about the case. Um, one is that the record indicates that the doctor, Dr. O'Connor, promised Alice Sullivan a nose that would look like Hedy Lamarr's nose. Have any of you ever heard of Hedy Lamarr? Yeah. She was a, a movie star, Hollywood movie star. From, she came from Europe, a big movie star um, back in the day. Um, you probably can't see this very well, but she has a very nice nose. So um, this is what she, Alice Sullivan was promised. This is what was delivered. Um, another interesting fact is that Dr. O'Connor, after this case, himself went to law school out in California. And the main reason that he went to law school was to defend himself in the 42 lawsuits that had been brought against him. That's a true statement. OK, um, some of you may have heard this, but there's a tradition in my uh, classes of students um, giving me creative submissions about the cases. So they write them, and I'm supposed to deliver them. Um, and here is a poem called A Nose by Any Other Name by Dr. Seuss, written by uh, one of my contract students. O'Connor's my name, and nose is my game. A nip and a snip, and you won't even drip. That was the call that lured in poor Alice, who desperately wanted a shorter proboscis. She sang and told jokes that left the crowd weak, but was really displeased with the length of her beak. She went to O'Connor and said, help me, can you? I always look like I'm eating a banana. No problem, he smiled. You don't have to search. I can stop birds from using your nose as a perch. A surgery or two, and things will work out. Your face will be gorgeous. You'll love your new snout. He cut some and snipped some and cut down some more. He took out the membrane that caused her to snore. When he was done, she expected a thrill to come when she saw what he'd done to her bill but she wasn't too happy with what he had saved. It was flattened and bulbous and also concave. In fact, when she saw it, she felt pretty glum, for now she looked like she was eating a plum. You didn't perform as, she, as you promised, she said. You stuck this gross nose on the front of my head. You blew it three times, and for that I want loot, for the anguish you caused by misshaping my snoot. It's true, I'm still working, my fans still applaud, with no thanks to you, you olfactory fraud. The court put some limits on what she could take as pay for O'Connor's nasal mistake. But Alice had suffered through her day in court, 
and thoughts of O'Connor will still make her snort. The case of Ms. Sullivan should give you a pause if you're thinking of chopping off part of your schnoz. For as Alice will say, you won't know how it goes. And when it's all over, a nose is a nose. OK, um, so after we state the facts and the procedural history, the, the history of the uh, court uh, handling of the case, what is the first question that is considered by the appellate court? Okay, so we have an opinion here from the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, the highest court in Massachusetts. One thing to notice is that the justice is uh, Justice Kaplan, and the thing that's notable about him is that before going on to the bench, for many years, he was a contracts professor at Harvard Law School. So this is someone who knows something about contract law. Okay, so what is the first question that Justice Kaplan considers um, in reviewing this case of Sullivan versus O'Connor? Yes? Whether it actually is an enforceable contract. Okay, whether it is actually an enforceable contract, and why wouldn't it be? Um, it talks about how doctors can't really guarantee their work in certain situations, and especially with um, psychological issues with their patients, that since it's a very um, varied by person, it, it's hard to guarantee anything. So um, in order to keep doctors able to practice, um, they kind of said that maybe contracts such as those are not. OK, I, I, very good. So. The first question is, should courts enforce agreements in which doctors promise certain results to patients? Okay, and just as you say, he's saying there's good reasons maybe we, we shouldn't. Um, because of the uncertainty, um, doctors um, seldom actually promise specific results. Um, sometimes optimism is heard as um, a promise. So you don't want your doctor to say, well, gee, I'll try this, but boy, I'm not sure it's going to work. You know, you have to want somebody to be upbeat, right? We're going to do this. Um, you're going to be better. Um, and that might be interpreted as a promise where it's merely uh, optimism. Okay, and then you made a point. Um, he says that he's concerned that enforcing these promises may cause doctors to practice defensive medicine. Okay, what does that mean? Why wouldn't we want doctors to practice defensive medicine. What is defensive medicine? Anyone? Yeah. Um, meaning that they wouldn't take risks in their practice in medical science and advances in med medical science depends on a certain amount of risk. Okay, but aren't we concerned about patients <laughs> rather than medical science? To say, well, I'm going to experiment on you. I'm going to risk on you so I can advance medical science. I said, no, thank you. Can you find someone else to uh, experiment on? I I'd rather just take care of me and not all of medical science. Right. It often may be in the patient's interest to take some risk. It's a w risk worth taking. But the doctor wouldn't do what was in the patient's best interest because the doctor was afraid of being sued. Okay, so how does Justice Kaplan resolve this question? Should courts enforce this kind of promise? Yes? She said short, that courts should take a middle ground. Okay. Um, why not just say no? Oh, because otherwise doctors would have a free hand to do whatever they wanted and they wouldn't have, if, if they weren't given defensive medicine, he was saying that doctors basically could be given whatever they wanted and it wouldn't really, if they didn't have to fear being sued. Okay, they always can be sued for malpractice, but why not say you can be sued for, if you screw up the job, if you're negligent in the job, but we're not going to enforce any promises against you. Why does Justice Kaplan say, well, I don't want to go that far. Yeah. Because then it would sort of, Right. He's worried about the enticements of charlatans, right? Um, charlatans will promise all kinds of things, um, and even if they do the procedure, it never had a chance, a chance of succeeding. Um, and so we're going to have a middle ground, all right? And what is the middle ground? 
Yes. Um, insisting on clear proof. Right. We will enforce them, but we'll insist on very clear proof. And we'll tell the jury that they need very clear proof before finding one of these promises enforceable. Okay, so that's the first question. Should these promises be enforced at all? What's the next question? And really the main question in this case. Yes? So should Sullivan be entitled to uh, recover for more than her out-of-pocket expenses? Should she be able to recover for more than out-of-pocket expenses? That's a good statement of the specific issue here. Uh, phrased more broadly, we might say, assuming that we're going to enforce this contract, what should the remedy be? What damages should she get? Well, let's, why do we even talk about damages? Why don't we just say, Dr. O'Connor, you promised a Hedy Lamar nose, you deliver a Hedy Lamar nose, or you go to jail. Or we'll fine you a certain amount until you do. Okay, would that work here? Yes. Well, I'm guessing that you can't do that, and that Hedy Lamar is not going to be in this woman's future. So I think that <laughs> you have to just uh, get damages because if he just keeps working on this person, it's going to get worse and worse probably. Okay. There's something very specific in the case about this. What, what does it say in the case? Anybody catch this? Yes. Okay, they say this configuration, referring to this, um, could not be improved by further surgery. Okay, let's say it could. Would you want the doctor be ordered to perform the surgery? Okay, I'm seeing people shake their heads no. I'm shaking my head no. Um, why? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're going to, he's performing the surgery only because he doesn't want to. He's ordered by the court to do it. You're unconscious. He's got a scalpel on your face. You know, I don't think I want to have that situation. Okay? So, in some cases, that's what we do. We say, you have to perform, Mr. Promisor, um, or you go to jail. You're in contempt of court. But in this case and lots of other cases, we say, well, we can't do that or we don't want to do that. And so, the best we can do is what? Yeah. Fine him for the expense to fix it or just the damages that it's caused by it. Make him pay money. Okay, we don't really call it a fine, but yeah, make him pay some money to the victim of the breach of contract. Okay, so <coughs> the case is mainly about how we figure out the proper measure of damages, the proper theory of damages that Sullivan can collect. Okay, and in doing so, and the reason that we assign this case is um, the court talks about three ideas. Okay, first idea Justice Kaplan calls restitution. Okay, this is a theory of recovery. What can Alice Sullivan recover? She can recover the amount of benefit that she conferred on Dr. O'Connor in performance of the contract. Okay, the benefit that Sullivan conferred on O'Connor in performance of the contract. This is quoting from the language of the opinion. Okay, the second idea, it's talked about last, but it's the second idea I want to talk about, um, Justice Kaplan calls reliance. And the idea there is to give um, Alice Sullivan enough money to put her back in the position she occupied before she ever crossed paths with Dr. O'Connor. That's our goal, get her back where she was before um, dealing with Dr. O'Connor at all. And then finally, expectancy, also called expectation. Uh, our goal here is to give Alice Sullivan enough money to put her in the position she would be in if the contract had been fully perfor performed. Okay, those are the three ideas. Okay, and what I'd like to do is try to put those ideas into operation by applying them to possible claims that Alice Sullivan can make against uh, Dr. O'Connor. So let's put these, some of these on the board. So what's the first obvious claim that Alice Sullivan can make against Dr. O'Connor for money? 
Um, it's so obvious that Dr. O'Connor didn't even complain about it. He said, that, yeah, it should be at least this. Okay, yes? Okay, so her out-of-pocket expenses, okay? This was $622 plus, right? And I'm just going to break that into the doctor's fee and hospital expenses, assuming that the 622 covers both. Okay, what else could she ask? What did she want? What did she think the recovery should be? What did she want the trial judge to tell the jury about how to come up with the damages? Yeah. Um, money for the pain and suffering she encountered from... That's not what she asked for um, in the instruction. Okay, but I want to get to that. So, so pain and suffering. Again, I'm going to uh, separate these into operations one and two and operation three, okay? What did she ask for? Yes? She asked to be able to recover the difference in value between the nose promised and the nose after the operations. Okay, the difference in value between nose promised, Hedy Lamar, and nose after, or nose delivered, bulbous asymmetric exhibit A over here. Okay, that's what she wants. Um, what else might she ask for? Yes? She didn't ask for it, but if it had an adverse effect on her career. Okay, employment. The court says she didn't prove any loss of employment, but conceivably she could have. Um, so lost income from employment. Okay, anything else? Be creative here, be imaginative. Sky's the limit. Anything else? Yes? This might fall into number two, but if she wanted to have another operation from a different doctor uh, uh, to fix it to get her the, the, the nose as promised, um, okay. Maybe the cost to have that surgery. The problem with that in this case is they said it couldn't be done by anybody. Okay. New, so costs of new surgery, another doctor. Anything else? Yes. This might be covered by number four, but um, not just loss of income from her current employment, but any future, like maybe she could never get another job as an entertainer. And then she had to find a new career for which she had to go to school and pay <coughs> three years of school for. And <laughs> okay. All right. Sad story. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Um, I'm not sure if she could do this, but sort of loss of the possibility. I don't know if she had a, a love interest or some sort of relationship, but if she didn't or if she, that her relationship broke up because of that. Loss of love interest. Okay. All right. One more. Yeah. Can you talk about the um, pain of the psychological knowledge that she had? Yeah. She's got to look in the mirror every day and see this. You know, the mental anguish of, of that. Okay. So let's say mental anguish. Okay. So this is a good enough list for our purposes. All right. So now what I want to do is ask which of these are recoverable under these theories, okay? That's, you know, that's, the client wants to know what can I recover? What money can I get? Okay, if our theory is that of restitution, which of these items is uh, recoverable? All right, let's start at number one. Um, Out-of-pocket expenses, doctor's fee. All right, and people shaking their head yes. Okay, why yes? So I'm going to put here restitution yes. Why? Is it so obvious you don't need to state it? Yeah. Because that's what she paid. She paid him to perform the operation. That was the benefit he got from performing the operation, the money that she paid to uh, him in performance of the contract. Okay? That is restitution. 
How about the hospital expenses? Don't go with the same. Okay, did he get a benefit from this? Okay, if the money isn't paid to him, it doesn't look like it's restitution. It's, it's not a benefit that he got. Okay, difference in value between those promised and those delivered? I'm, I'm asking only about restitution now, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through with restitution, through with reliance, and then through with expectation, okay? Um, anyone wanna say yes to this? No, it's not this because this is focusing on her, right? Restitution focuses on him. What benefit did he get? Okay, this is her loss, not his benefit. Pain and suffering? Unless he's a sadist? No. Okay, lost income from employment? No, again, this is her loss, not his gain. Um, cost of new surgery, another doc? No. Loss of love interest? No. Mental anguish? No. Okay, so this is all, this is all. Any other possible benefit that um, the doctor got out of this? Yeah. Couldn't he say because of the bad publicity he received from the court case that he didn't receive any benefit or receive negative benefit from it? Possibly, possibly. Um, uh, that the, the net gain was zero because of the uh, publicity. He lost uh, other jobs um, because of it. Okay, so um, any other uh, benefits to him? Well, the only other possible one might be the benefit of ex getting the experience. Okay, let's take reliance. Okay, doctor's fee. All right, now we're focused on her, not him. We want to get her back to where she was before she even met up with Dr. O'Connor. Okay, do we give her a doctor's fee back? Yes. Hospital expenses? Yes. Difference in value between those promised and those delivered? You're saying no. Okay. Um, if we're getting up, to, getting up to those promised, that's not reliance, right? That's getting to where she was promised, not where um, she started. Pain and suffering. Operations one and two. I'm seeing some people say yes and some people say no. Oh, yes. Well, no, because she contracted to have the pain and suffering for the first two, right? Okay. Had she never talked to Dr. O'Connor, would she have had the pain and suffering in Operations 1 and 2? No. Right. We're trying to get her back to where she was. So, reliance. Operation 3? Yes. Okay. Lost income from employment. Um, to the extent that it was less than what she was already earning, yes. Okay? Loss of income from not having a heady Lamar nose instead of the long straight nose, no. Okay? Cost of new surgery of another doc? No, because that's going to get her, that's she's trying to get better, not unless it's just trying to get back to where she was, then maybe yes. Loss of love interest? Possibly yes. Okay, mental anguish? Yes. Okay, expectation. Out of pocket expenses. I'm saying some yes and some no. Okay, anyone want to take a stand on this? No, because if the contract would have been fully performed, she would have. Right, and this is what uh, Justice Kaplan says. If the contract had been performed, this money would have been spent. So we say no to expectation. Difference in between value, no's promised and no's delivered. You've said it twice, you're right twice. Expectation, that's the definition of expectation. Okay, pain and suffering, operations one and two. No, Kaplan says no, and again, for the same reason, you know, unless it was greater pain and suffering than if he had done the job right but the pain and suffering that she would have to go through to get the Hedy Lamar knows no. What about operation three? Yes, okay, because had the contract been performed as promised, there wouldn't have been an operation number three, okay? Lost income from employment? 
Okay? Here you might want to get all the way to what employment, you know, what income she would have had with the Hedy Lamar um, nose. Okay? Cost of new surgery, another doc. Okay, depending on what we're tr trying to do, if we're trying to get her up to Hedy Lamar, yes. Loss of love interest. Okay, assuming that her love interest likes Hedy Lamar better than long and straight, um, I guess maybe yes. Expectation. Okay, again, she wouldn't have the mental anguish if the contract had been performed and she got uh, Hedy Lamar. Okay, so this is just very quickly trying to put into um, effect these three ideas. Okay, there's lots more that we could talk about in this case. Um, which one does Justice Kaplan choose? Um, he says he doesn't have to choose. Why is it true that he doesn't have to choose? Uh, do you agree with him when he says he doesn't have to choose between expectation and reliance? Okay, um, I do want to move to my next creative submission, and I need some help from uh, Kiki D uh, to do this. Hello. You said you'd fix my nose. Two operations I tried. No success, my nose is disfigured. We'll operate a third time. Oh, oh how, how should, should it go? go? The, the jury's, jury's told. Expectations too big. Restitution's too small. Reliance gets you back where you were. Money for doctor's costs. But there's no job that you've lost. My mental distress is high. Can't say I didn't try. Medical, non-commercial, personal. Expectations too big. Restitution's too small. Reliance gets you back where you were. My pain and suffering. But you expected those things. I wanted a heady Lamar look. Hey, that's the chance that you took. Oh, oh just, just goes to show. You really should know. Expectations too big. Restitution's too small. Reliance gets you back where you were. Don't go breaking my nose. I won't go breaking your nose. Don't, don't go, go breaking my. my. Don't, don't go breaking my. Don't go breaking my nose. Don't go breaking my. Don't go breaking my. Don't go breaking my nose. Thank you. not really Kiki D at Sarah Casco. It was a 2L. I was in my contracts class for this uh, case last time. Um, we have a few uh, minutes, so um, there's a lot more that we could talk about in this case, but I wanted to leave some time uh, for you to ask me questions. Um, if you do have a question, if you could just wait until the microphone is delivered to you, we'd like to get your question uh, on the videotape. And this can be about what goes on in law school classrooms, anything about BU Law School, law schools in general, um, anything that you think a faculty member would be helpful with. Any questions? Any questions about curriculum, about what goes on in a classroom? I could ask some more. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, how much do you typically deal with st students, particularly first-year students? Are you in your office a lot? Do you do work with them? Okay. Um, the question is, what kind of interaction do I have with students, particularly first-year students? Um, and the answer is an awful lot. Uh, uh, contracts uh, in this school is a year-long course, so I, s students get to know me very well. I get to know them very well on a personal basis. Uh, through the first year. 
All faculty members have uh, prescribed office hours, usually at least two hours a week. And that's a time when you know that you can find the instructor in his or her office uh, and speak with them. Um, usually every class, students come up with questions afterwards. Um, and people can drop in my office at other times. So there is an awful lot of interaction between students and uh, faculty here. Um, and I think that's particularly true in the first year. Upper class, um, as you develop specialties, you'll tend to gravitate to faculty members who have the same interest in law that you do. Um, and you may be involved in a journal, and you get a group of friends and faculty members that are involved with that. Yes, there's a microphone on. OK, if you could put one major warning label on your first year of law school, uh, I guess one piece of advice that we all should know before we come here, what would you tell us? Huh, one piece of advice. Uh, you know, I, I think my, my biggest piece of advice would be um, let the system work for you. That is, um, your goal should be to try to meet the expectations that, you, that your instructors and classmates have for you. So don't look for shortcuts. Don't panic that it's not working. Um, buy into the system. Um, try every class. Try to be as prepared as you can for what is going to happen in that class. Uh, try to get on the wavelength of your instructors. Um, do what your instructors ask you to do. Uh, work with your fellow students, support them, they'll support you. Um, don't be unduly anxious about things. Um, you know, it's part of a process. Any process that is worthwhile is going to stretch you. Um, everybody else is going to have the same uh, feelings of being stretched and feeling incompetent at times. But believe in the system. Um, and then after the first year, talk to me. And if you say, well, it didn't work for me, um, you know, then we can talk about that. But I think for most people, if you sort of let the system work, uh, you'll find that you learn an awful lot. Um, and you'll come out of the first year, and people will be asking you, all, all your friends and family will be asking you all kinds of legal questions. And you'll be saying, well, I don't know about that. And you know, different laws are different, and state, the state has different laws. And I can't answer that question. But uh, most students come out with an intellectual self-confidence that they didn't have before, uh, an ability to sort of speak more clearly, argue more persuasively, get to the heart of an issue much more quickly. Um, and that's greatly empowering. Um, so I think let the system work for you is my one, if I had to pick a single piece of advice, that would be it. I don't know whether this is going to be Thing on. Okay. I don't know whether this is going to be possible to answer or even if there is an answer, but at what point do you find that your students, all of your students, start to see the forest for the trees in your course? Is there like a point in the semester where it's like, and all of a sudden everyone's getting it? Or um, I don't think so. Um, I, a lot of people, not everyone would agree with me on this. Some people think that, you know, in the middle or you know, two-thirds through the semester, it all starts to come together. I teach a year-long course. Sometimes people say in the middle of the second semester it comes together. But I think it really is different for different people. Um, and I, I think you know, the problem with saying at this point you're supposed to get it, you, you get to that point point, say, well, I still don't get it. I'm the only one. Uh, no, it, you just uh, different people get it in different ways. And sometimes you're not sure of everything that you do know. You know more than you think you know. So I don't think I would look for a particular point in time where it's all supposed to click. Um, it'll start off like you know it's not clear what you're getting out of this. So you have a law school class, and instead of lecture, you have questions. And often, those questions never get resolved. And you say, well, I understand this question, but what are the answers to these questions? Um, but the process is in developing the questions, um, learning to find the right questions. Um, and not, so importantly, what the answers are. Um, and so that can be intellectually unsettling. And you know, you're not lectured at, so it's not just acquiring knowledge. It's skills training, building skills, how to read, how to speak, how to argue, how to think. And, and, and those things are often hard to measure. Um, so no magic time. Everybody is different.
Yes. Down here in this row. Here. How is a typical, well, I guess in your case, a contracts class sort of structured? Like, do you do sort of, you teach the theories and then do we look at a lot of case law? What would a sort of standard structure be like? Okay, different instructors have different methods, but most first year instructors and most for, first year classes are case oriented. Uh, and that's definitely true for my case. So I don't begin with grand theory. I begin with what did Alice Sullivan say to Dr. O'Connor and what did Dr. O'Connor say to Alice Sullivan. So I start with the stories. Um, and then we build up from reading all these stories, actual cases. Okay, these aren't hypotheticals. This is actual disputes people have had. Um, and use those to build what the doctrine is and then uh, larger theory. But it's very much the particular going to the general in most courses. And the reading assignments aren't long, but you have to read them with a degree of care that um, people rarely have to read things. You know, you have to know every line of the, of the case. Be prepared to answer any, any question about that case. And I have one other question. Sure. Um, do law students do, I guess, drafting? or I mean, in terms of the exams and how that's structured, is it sort of writing a lot of, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly if I'm Okay. Do law students correctly. do drafting? How does the exam process work? A sample brief or something like that. Okay. Um, in addition to your four substantive courses each semester, and a couple of courses are year long, so they count as one each semester, um, you have a first year writing program. And in that program, you will write memos, briefs, you will do an oral argument, um, legal writing of, of various kinds. It's in a small group supervised by a lawyer um, and graded uh, by a lawyer. The exam process um, usually have either just one or two exams in the entire course, a mid-year exam and a final, or sometimes just a final exam. And usually those exams are essay exams. And in, case, in my situation, I would just tell you a story, right? I would tell you the story of Sullivan versus O'Connor, and then you would have to determine what are the problem, what are the legal issues that are involved in this story. And then you try to bring to bear on those issues the course material and try to make, you know, what are the arguments that um, Sullivan's lawyer would make? What are the arguments that Dr. O'Connor's lawyer would make? And how do I expect them to be resolved? Um, so it's an essay type uh, question. And instructors grade those questions. The, the professors are graded. We don't have any teaching assistants doing any of the grading. Yes. Um, is there anything in particular that an entering student should know before entering law school? Or if not, um, is there anything that would be beneficial to know, like in terms of books, read, or something like that? Um, I don't think there's anything necessarily that you need to know. Um, there are a number of books of introduction to law school. I don't think they're all that important. Sometimes they can reduce anxiety a little bit. Um, one of my colleagues here, Ward Farnsworth, who many of you will have as a first-year instructor, um, has just written a book um, which has a toolkit for legal arguments, economic arguments, psychological arguments, philosophical arguments. Um, and I think that, of all the books I've seen, I think that's one of the best. Um, it's by Ward Farnsworth, and I'm not sure of the title, but it's a legal practitioner or a toolbox for law school. Um, it just came out. Um, so that's one book that I think could be useful. But you do perfectly well. You know, we don't expect you, people come from all kinds of backgrounds, all different majors. Um, we don't expect any core of knowledge uh, starting out. Back to um, earlier question in terms of so if there's one big exam at the end of the semester, um, is there any like are there any assignments along the way or any like kind of practice in terms of writing an essay and how to frame an essay in the way you would expect a student to do during an exam so that to kind of keep to kind of make sure you're on track and to see what you're expecting and yeah, see it's a good question delivering. if you don't get any assessment until the end of the course you know how do you prepare for that. 
Um, I think one good way to prepare for that is to look at previous exams given by the instructor. And uh, often they will have memos describing what it was they were looking for, how they graded those. Um, and often students will take those exams and share answers uh, with each other, um, look at the memo. Um, and some instructors um, will also be glad to look at uh, a practice exam that you wrote uh, and give you some feedback uh, on that. Um, I think you know, taking some uh, previous exams, particularly with the time limits that are involved, is a good way to prepare for a final exam. Because nothing you know, quite replicates it. Um, in class, things are, you know, the areas are kind of flagged for you. It's sort of labeled as to what you're talking about. Whereas if you just get a story, you're not sure which part of the course is involved. And so taking old exams is a good way of getting ready for that. Well, thank you. You're a great class. Um, I hope to see many of you in the classroom uh, starting in the fall. Um, have a great day. Take advantage of your time here. Ask questions, particularly ask questions of uh, current students. I mean, those are the people that will give you the straight scoop uh, about BU Law School. So um, don't pass up the opportunity to get uh, feedback from them. Thanks a lot. See you either at lunch or hopefully next fall.